Welcome to another moment in the Word. I pray your Bibles are open and I pray you're able to join with me as we meditate on God's Word. And this is an incredible, wonderful passage. It's simple, profound, and complex all at the same time. We're looking at John chapter 6 and we'll begin at verse 47 and we'll be meditating down to verse 51. So it's four verses. Here it goes. Jesus begins by saying, Verily, verily, I say to you, he that believes on me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread that comes down from heaven that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread... He shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus begins by using a common expression that he says over and over in this whole discourse in John chapter 6, and that is, verily, verily. In the Latin is veritas, but in the Hebrew, as it is in the Greek, if you were looking at the actual Greek text, is Amen, 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 Amen. Truly, truly. Anytime Jesus uses this expression, it means that this is an emphatic statement. It means that there is a break in the discourse. You find it over and over. For instance, you find it in verse 26. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say to you, you seek me, not because you're looking for a sign, but instead, you're just looking for more bread. And then he says it in verse 32. He says, Verily, verily, I say to you, Moses, he did not give you that bread from heaven, but my father did. And then again, you find it in verse of 44 that we're looking at now, or 47 rather, and then verse 53 is the last time Jesus will say to them, Verily, verily, I say to you, except you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. So anytime you find this expression, it is an emphatic statement, and it's actually a marker in the text as he is speaking. Something has changed. Something has been developed more. And so he's saying, most assuredly, verily, verily, I say to you, he that believes, the word believes there is in the, it's a present participle. It means believing. It is not just simply, I believed. It is where I believe, I place my trust, my faith, my hope, my life in him. And so he says, he who believes in me has, and now it's a present indicative verb. Present means right now. Indicative is indicating a statement of fact. And so consequently, he is saying you possess right now. If you believe and have been believing in Jesus, you have, not when you die, not when you have some experience later on in your Christian walk, not when you get to heaven, but you have, and it's present tense indicative, forever eternal life. Now, that is a real promise and a blessing. So that actually fills in with what Jesus had said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 15. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then he gives the reason why in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. So this is an implicit invitation to believe and an implicit warning for those who are not believing. You have eternal life if you believe, and you have eternal death if you do not. So it begins with a simple, literal statement, this little section that we're looking at, verse 47. But verse 48, he now is going to take a metaphor. And the metaphor is to say, I am the bread of life. This whole section now is answering the two objections that the Jews had when he was in the synagogue, and they are uh, uh, saying, and we'll find it in verse 41, when he says, I am the bread of life that came down from heaven. 
And so they're going to argue first, what does this mean that he came from heaven? We know him. He's Joseph and Mary's son. He didn't come from heaven, and Jesus had already answered that. That's when he goes into verse 42 down to 46. That's to answer his origin. Now he answers the first part, and that is, I am the bread. So Jesus now is stating, I am the the bread. It's a simple metaphor. The I am, however, immediately is clear that's a reference to God. Because in Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, you tell Pharaoh, I am that I am sent you. I am, I am. It's an emphatic statement, I am, by the way, is the to-be verb in Hebrew. It is the one who was, who is, and who is to come. It is forever. So when he says, I am the bread of life, he is stating the eternal one is the eternal bread of life. That is so wonderful. You find this expression, and this is the first time you find it as applied to the I am's in John. You find that in chapter 8, when he heals the man that's blind, I am the light of the world. In chapter 10, he will say, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. Chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me should never perish. In chapter 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In chapter 15, I am the vine. And then finally, those who reject Christ, he says in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he asked, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am, and they fall backwards. That expression, I am, is the declaration of the personal name of God. The name that no man knew that was on the thigh of the one who was on the white horse, returning to declare back what was taken in the garden and now restored by that one who is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Oh, what a wonderful statement. Now he says, I am the bread of life. That's exactly what he was saying in verse 34 when Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me should never thirst. Verse 35. And now we're looking at the next verse, and that's verse 49. And he says, your. Notice it is not referring to your, um, when he says your fathers, it, he is not saying my father, because my father is in heaven. So he's making a distinction there. He is obviously stating your fathers. And they ate, that is a historical statement, it's in the aorist tense, they did eat the manna, the manna, and you think about it, it is an everyday miracle. Now many of these folks died in the wilderness, and many of them did not go to heaven, they rejected, they did not believe and trust in Messiah. Instead, they were just benefiting from the daily miracles. And there are many, maybe that you know, and maybe you, who are benefiting from the miraculous provision of our God, but never truly trusting in the one who has given. So Jesus is saying, your, brother, your fathers ate of the manna in the wilderness, and they died. You, the people he's talking to, are among the 5,000 men, and their wives and children, maybe 30,000 people, have benefited from his provision, and never, ne never recognized that Jesus is God. So the physical bread sustains physical life when Jesus says man doesn't live by bread alone. That doesn't mean that we don't need daily bread. It's just simply stating that bread sustains physical life. What Jesus now is offering is the eternal bread himself, which gives eternal life because he is the I am 
He is the eternal God. And so he says, this, verse 50, this is the bread, not manna, but bread, sustaining bread, which comes down, and it's a present participle, which means is coming down from heaven. He has come into the presence of those who are witnessing him that one may eat, now it's not talking about your fathers, but you personally, that one may eat. And you'll find this, you find it over and over again. Jesus is talking about eating. He is talking about feeding. He is talking about ingesting. Notice how often this comes up. You will find it in verse uh, 51, uh, actually 49, and then 50. You will find it in 51 that we are to eat of this bread. Verse 52, that how can this man say that he gives his flesh to eat? Verse 53, verily I say to you, except you eat the flesh. Verse 54, he that eats my flesh. We'll skip verse 55. Verse 56, he that eats my flesh. Verse 57, that he that eats my flesh, eats me, even shall live by me. Verse 58, he that eats of this bread shall live forever. And so we find nine times in the next few verses, it's repeated again and again and again. Why is that? Because Jesus is explaining what it means to believe. He's explaining what it means to hear and then to learn. Hearing is external. Learning is internal. You can look at the menu, but you're not going to get healthy by looking at a menu. You've got to eat the food that you have chosen from the menu. And that's what he is saying here. This matter of eating means that you have to respond to a need. You're eating because you're hungry. You're eating, and that's what it says in the Beatitudes. Blessed are they that hunger, and they thirst for righteousness. Hungering first, and that you're responding, and then you're appropriating. You're taking it in, and once you take it in, it becomes a part of you. But eating is intensely personal. Your food is yours. It becomes a part of you. You are what you eat. You eat junk food, you'll be unhealthy. You eat the bread of life and you live forever. That's what he is saying. That's why that emphasis on eating, that you may eat and not die. Why? Because Jesus is God. He is eternal and therefore you will live forever. Now verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. So he is making that contrast between the manna that didn't come down from heaven. It came from the sky. It came from the atmosphere. God provided it. It was miraculous. But it didn't come from heaven. But he came from the Father. He came from heaven. And that's what he is saying. The origin has been confirmed. But he, the bread of life, has come down from heaven. And he says, if anyone eats, anyone responds. And that includes you. To this bread, he will live forever. Why? Because he is God. And the bread that I give, that word I is emphatic. He is saying, I, I myself have given, shall give. Now, that's also an interesting word because he says, shall give twice. He says, shall give his flesh. And then he goes on to say, which I give for the world. So when he says, I give, that's actually a term that is used of sacrifice. He is giving, not just simply giving his time. He's not just giving his help and talent. He's giving himself. That's a sacrificial term. And so consequently, he has given his flesh. Notice, it's not his body. The difference is, when we talk about the congregational body, we're talking about the whole. We're talking about the flesh. We're talking about he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is laid upon him. It's the parts of his body. He in his flesh, Paul says, there is nothing, no good thing that is in my flesh. He is talking about that 
which is within, that he is giving to you, that you might receive him within, that you might have eternal life. And notice he says, which I shall give in both of those cases, it's future. He is not giving yet. That's going to happen a year from now. It will happen when he gives himself on the cross and he becomes sin for you, that you through his righteousness might be made righteous, through his death might live. And so he talks about, will give as a sacrifice for the life, and now it's the world. It's not just the Jewish nation, it's the, all nations. It's not just those who have been blessed to have the word and the Tanakh, the Torah, but to those who have never heard that the scriptures might be given to them. And many of you living in Pakistan and India and Africa and Indonesia and other parts of the world that are listening and teaching God's word now, that they, the world, might be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his son. I pray today that you are blessed and that you're not only blessed. Remember the Hebrew word for blessed means grace given for a purpose. That you are blessed today so that you might be a blessing to others. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father, for your word and for how it changes us and eating it every day. How it's cumulative, how it affects us, how it grows us, and how it causes us to love you more, to serve you more, and to also, Father, show you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.